Welcome to Vickers Health. I'm Coach Steve. Let's talk about carrier oils because nobody in the fitness industry really talks about it. So let's put one video out, the most comprehensive guide to carrier oils that you can find on the internet. And let's talk about the carrier oils which are suitable for long-term use and which are definitely not suitable because they cause systemic inflammation. They should be avoided altogether. Now, in this video, we'll have to differentiate between organic carrier oils and synthetic carrier oils. Off the top of my head, the organic carrier oils are going to be castor oil, grapeseed oil, cottonseed oil, arachis oil, which is peanut oil, but it's slightly refined, even though it's still organic, it's slightly refined. Keep that in mind. There's MCT, medium chain triglycerides, and coconut oil. Sesame oil is being used. Olive oil is being used. And then I've heard that several underground labs use either peach oil or tea oil. So those are all organic. Now, coconut oil can be further refined into migliol, and whether that's migliol 840 or migliol 817, or one of the other numbers that migliol comes in, there's several different kinds. And then there's pure synthetic carrier oils. One of them is ethyl oleate, which is rather popular and commonly found in a lot of underground labs. And whether they use ethyl oleate with grapeseed oil together to increase the solvency of certain uh, raws and hold it in solution, or it's 100% ethyl oleate. Then there's propylene glycol, abbreviated to PEG, not pegging. Monoethylene glycol, abbreviated to MEG. And then there's guaiacol, and I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but I think it's guaiacol. And it's probably the most toxic synthetic carrier oil you can find. And it's also been available, and it was very, very popular at certain points, because injectable anadrol or injectable anivar or injectable d ball were all suspended in guaiacol. And guaiacol is so potent, you can literally dissolve the ink of your car. Guaiacol is probably the strongest solvent carrier oil that's being used by underground labs nowadays. And even though it's classified as an organic compound, because it's highly refined, I'll just label it as synthetic. And I want to differentiate between organic carrier oils that don't cause any systemic inflammation and synthetic carrier oils or carrier oils that do cause systemic inflammation. So let's go over the list of organic carrier oils first, because those are going to be the ones that you will end up using for the longest periods of time, because they don't cause any systemic inflammation. And especially when you're interested in purchasing pharmaceutical grade compounds, those all have organic carrier oils. Now there are several FDA approved pharmaceutical companies that still use ethyl oleate, but keep in mind that ethyl oleate was never approved in the Western world. The US FDA never approved ethyl oleate as a suitable carrier oil. So when they're FDA approved, they're probably FDA approved in a third world country. And that's where some of these ethyl oleate products come from. Here in Thailand, we have several products, several steroids that are produced with ethyl oleate. And those increase systemic inflammation tremendously as well, even though they're FDA approved. So you really have to shop carefully, sort of say, before you purchase one of the anabolic steroids in the market. And whether that's through a pharmacy, through your hospital or on the black market, do your due diligence and investigate and find out which carrier oil they use because some of the FDA approved products can still cause systemic inflammation. And that's what we're trying to avoid here. So the carrier oils, the organic ones that are suitable to use, castor oil is very popular with Bayer. Um, you can find that in Testovirin or uh, you know, Prima Bolin, which is my favorite compound to use. Rotex Medica also uses castor oil. And then there's a couple other companies that are not very popular or not very well known that use castor oil as their carrier oil as well. Nabito, for example, Bayer Nabito uses castor oil. Now, the reason why they use castor oil even though it has very low solvency, so they have to mix a reasonably high amount of benzobenzoate in, uh, into the product. So you'll see that, you know, a testosterone enanthate with castor oil is almost 30% benzobenzoate. And I know all the underground labs out there are going to, you know, you know, whip their fingers out and say, no, 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 it's way too high. Listen, I've used reasonably high dosages of Bayer Primobolin and Bayer testosterone enanthate, resulting in maybe 14 milliliters of uh, injectable castor oil per week. So that's 10 milliliters for the Primobolin and 4 milliliters for the test of iron, 1,000 milligrams of test enanthate and 1,000 milligrams of uh, Primobolin enanthate. Yeah, 14 milliliters per week. So let's see, 30% of uh, benzobenzoate, let's say 4 milliliters of benzobenzoate. And guess what? My high sensitivity C-reactive protein test was 0.5 milligrams per liter to 1 milligram per liter, which is very low on the inflammation range. So it's not something you have to worry about. 
just keep in mind the benzobenzoate content is going to be a little bit higher. And if you're allergic to benzobenzoate, it's something you definitely want to avoid. So castor oil is always going to be accompanied with a decent amount of benzobenzoate to increase the solvency of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. And in this case, it's going to be either testosterone or primabolin, because I haven't found many injectable steroids besides primabolin and testosterone, anethate or nebido, the long-acting testosterone, that use castor oil as a carry oil. It's personally one of my favorites, so that's why we're going over that one first. Castor oil has a reasonably high viscosity, but the inclusion of benzyl benzoate lowers that a little bit. And benzyl benzoate acts a little bit as a prodrug, increasing the delivery while it's being absorbed in the body. So when you inject castor oil, the benzyl benzoate is going to absorb first and increase serum concentrations of testosterone or prebivalin reasonably quickly. Then the castor oil remains behind in the depot with part of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. And that increases the half-life to up to 34 days, 33.9 days, I believe. And then it really depends on where you inject, because some of the muscles that you inject into have a little bit higher clearance time compared to other muscles. So I think the shoulders were shown to absorb uh, one milliliter of oil faster than the glutes or quads did. It's one of the older studies that you can find on PubMed. Different muscles have different clearance times of the depot that you inject. And, and of course, the volume and the carry oil and all that stuff increases or shortens the half-life as well. So the reason why Bayer chose castor oil for testosterone anethate, testosterone undecinate or primbolin anethate is because it matches the half-life of the steroid ester. So anethate is a half-life of 10 to 12 days and decinate about 18 to 21 days. But because castor oil has a very long half-life of up to 34 days, you keep serum concentrations much more stable when you chose to go with castor oil because it clears the depot so much slower compared to a grapeseed oil or cottonseed oil or one of the synthetic carrier oils. So by choosing castor oil, you're actually allowing yourself to do less frequent injections because it stays in the depot longer and the benzoenzoate creates a little bit of a product raising serum concentrations a little bit faster. So it's almost, not completely, but almost like a sustenon. It has a short acting absorption and a longer acting absorption. And that's why I think castor oil is a superior carrier oil compared to all the other carrier oils that are available there because it requires less injection frequency and now your blood levels are significantly more stable compared to MCT, grapeseed oil, or cottonseed oil, or any of the other organic carrier oils that have a lot lower viscosity rate. Second on the list are grapeseed and cottonseed oil, which are used by several pharmaceutical companies. So when you buy testosterone cypionate, for example, FDA approved testosterone cypionate, it usually comes in grapeseed and cottonseed oil. Now, even though cypionate has a similar half-life as anethate, you would require lower dosed, more frequent injections with grapeseed and cottonseed oil because it has a much lower viscosity compared to castor oil. And now it leaves the depot significantly faster, increasing aromatization. So the faster the active pharmaceutical ingredient leaves the depot, the more aromatization can occur. So testosterone recipientating cottonseed oil, for example, would leave the depot maybe two or three times faster compared to castor oil. And even though the half-lives are very comparable, Ideally, you would inject testosterone cypionate every other day, whereas testosterone anethate and castor oil, you can inject once a week, twice a week, and it should be sufficient to maintain serum concentrations. Now, grapeseed oil and cottonseed oil are very popular with underground labs because it's readily available and it's reasonably easy to suspend rosin. What a lot of underground labs don't tell you is they'll still use a little bit of ethyl oleate to help with the solvency besides the benzobenzoate the cottonseed oil, they add a little bit of ethyl oleate. So keep that in mind, you might still notice a significant amount of inflammation when you're using underground labs that claim to use only cottonseed oil and grapeseed oil, because there might be a little bit of ethyl oleate in there, maybe 10%, maybe 20%, alongside 10 to 20% of benzobenzoate. And they won't mention it on product, so you'll just see Excipients QS, where in reality it's part you know, organic carrier oil, a little bit of synthetic carrier oil and benzobenzoate uh, to increase the solvency. Black market, underground labs, you never know what you get. And that's why I always advise everybody just to stick to pharmaceutical grades because what's mentioned on the box is exactly what you're getting in the product. The amount of active pharmaceutical ingredient, the amount of carrier oil, the amount of benzobenzoate and the amount of benzoyl alcohol, which is used as a preservative. And that you'll find in any pharmaceutical company or any underground lab hopefully they add a little bit of benzoyl alcohol to ensure sterility 
And I think the only product that I've seen of a pharmaceutical grade is actually testosterone and decunate. They don't use benzoyl alcohol, which is surprising, but hey, it's Bayer. They usually know what they're doing. So let's go back to cotton and grapeseed oil for a bit. It has medium amounts of viscosity, so you require a little bit more frequent injection if you want to maintain serum concentration and whether that's uh, with a testosterone enanthate or testosterone propionate or testosterone acetate. You know, some of the underground labs like to use that. It's a little bit faster than propionate. And, you know, for the guys that like trembolone acetate, testosterone acetate and maybe a mastrone propionate, fast acting esters resulting in the most stable serum concentrations. So I feel that cottonseed oil and grapeseed oil are reasonably close and interchangeable. Their medium viscosity allows for every other day injections, whether that's testosterone enanthate or testosterone acetate. So it doesn't really matter which ester you end up using. Every other day or everyday injections are advised due to our medium viscosity level and the way they clear from the depot. Now, another organic carrier oil that's reasonably close in viscosity to cottonseed oil and grapeseed oil is sesame oil. And I no longer see that or no longer see it being used on the underground lab scene. I can't find any pharmaceutical company that uses sesame oil, but I know it was used a couple of years ago as a carrier oil within underground lab. And it could simply be due to supply and demand. I know that cottonseed oil and grapeseed oil are readily available in USP GRADE, which stands for United States Pharmacopoeia. So that follows certain standards and you know that the quality of the carrier oil is insured which is a shame because I know that it doesn't cause systemic inflammation and it's certainly a much healthier and sustainable choice as a carrier oil compared to the synthetic carrier oils, which are almost toxic to the body. So let's move over to Arachis oil, which is technically an organic carrier oil. It's refined peanut oil, but it can still cause systemic inflammation. It doesn't happen with everybody, but I know that it happens in, you know, I don't really want to quantify it. It either happens or it doesn't happen. And you never really know until you inject a little bit and you go get your high sensitivity C-reactive protein checked. I believe that Aspen, Sustanon 250 and Organon Decadurabolin are both produced with Arachis oil. I think there's another brand in India that produces testosterone enanthate that uses Arachis oil. And it might even be Bayer, but I'm not 100% sure on that. So with Arachis oil, you're never really sure if you're going to get inflammation or not. And the only real way to determine that is by getting your hands dirty using 1cc and then a couple days later you check your high sensitivity C-reactive protein levels and see if it elevated above baseline. There are several underground labs and third world pharmaceutical companies that use either peach oil or tea oil. Personally, I don't really have experience with peach or tea oil, but I've seen that on some of my clients that it doesn't really increase systemic inflammation. I know that third world pharma isn't exactly true western world pharma, but it appears that tea and peach oil are suitable for long term use because from the blood work that I've seen, they don't increase systemic inflammation like some of the synthetic carrier oils. Last on the list of organic carrier oils is coconut oil or MCT oil. MCT oil is of course refined coconut oil, but it appears that it doesn't cause any systemic inflammation like some of the other refined oils do. Now, I found MCT and coconut oil to be very, very suitable for short esters, like an acetate or a propionate, maybe even a phenyl propionate. But because the clearance from the depot is, is relatively fast, it absorbs within a couple of hours, you definitely want to inject every day when you use a compound that's dissolved in MCT oil. And even if that's a testosterone enanthate, because look at it this way, if MCT oil absorbs within a couple hours, all that testosterone enanthate is dumped into the bloodstream and the endothelial tissue and now it really starts converting into estrogen. So you want to keep your blood levels as stable as possible. With MCT oil, you should do daily injections of a smaller amount to keep your serum concentrations the most stable. Now, I used to have a little trick to determine if your carrier oil was going to cause systemic inflammation or not. You take a little drop of the liquid on your fingertips and you try to rub the ink off a syringe. The ink doesn't come off with castor oil, it doesn't come off with grapeseed oil, not with cottonseed oil, not with arachis oil, but it does come off with MCT oil, even though it doesn't cause systemic inflammation, but arachis oil has a potential to do that. So it's not a 100% foolproof method, but it might be the first uh, way to determine if you're going to get systemic inflammation or not. You confirm with your source or underground lab to see which carrier oil they're using, if it's MCT 
the ink will rub off from a syringe. If it's cotton or grapeseed oil, it shouldn't rub off unless they're using ethyl oleate that they're not telling you about. And if it's a synthetic carrier oil with a very high solvency, not only will the ink rub completely off, but the rubber plunger of the syringe, whether that's an insulin syringe or a 1ml, 3ml syringe, the rubber plunger will slowly dissolve. So you can't preload your syringes with synthetic carrier oil or MCT oil because it has such strong solvent properties that it will slowly degrade the rubber plunger. And the last thing you want is when you're halfway through your injection, you see a little piece of rubber disintegrate from the plunger and now it's creeping towards your injection needle. Yeah, I had to abort one time. You see that rubber piece travel into the syringe and I immediately stopped, pulled everything out and threw it away. I never used synthetic air all after that. You don't want to inject rubber. It's nasty and disgusting and it will never ever go away. White blood cells will encapsulate it. You get some scar tissue, some calcium buildup, and it doesn't matter how strong the elbows of your deep tissue massage therapist are. They'll break apart the scar tissue, but the rubber will still be inside your body. It's, it's disgusting. Yeah, I know. Shit happens, you learn the hard way. Okay, back to MCT. So with that test, to see if the ink comes off of your syringe, MCT will dissolve it and the righteous oil doesn't do it. So it's not 100% foolproof, but it's just a first line of defense to assess if you're carrying oil of a new underground lab or pharmaceutical grade company that you just purchased, if it's gonna cause systemic inflammation or not. So that's the first step. The second step, step would be to actually inject it and go check your high sensitivity C-reactive protein. You don't wanna do a normal or a conventional C-reactive protein test because the inflammation might not be detectable. So your inflammation might be two milligrams per liter on a conventional C-reactive uh, protein test, but then you do a high sensitivity C-reactive protein test and it might be 10 milligrams per liter or 15 or even 20. I've seen 50, uh, not comparing a, a conventional to a high sensitivity, but I've seen 50 milligrams per liter on a high sensitivity C-reactive protein test. That was caused by injectable anadrol suspended in guaiacol. Nasty. So the reference range for high sensitivity C-reactive protein or conventional is between zero to five milligrams per liter. You know? Ideally, you want to keep that below one milligram per liter. Now, there's a lot of different things that can cause systemic inflammation, drinking, smoking, recreational drugs. If you have a food intolerance to gluten, for example, environmental pollutants, whether in your drinking water or the air that you're breathing, and even severe muscular trauma following a hypertrophy workout is going to increase C-reactive protein levels a little bit. But all of those combined shouldn't raise C-reactive protein levels on the high sensitivity test above five milligrams per liter. So anytime you see your high sensitivity CRP over five milligrams per liter, it's probably the carrier oil that you're injecting. So ideally you keep it between zero to one milligram per liter. Yeah. So again, to remind you, 10 milliliters of castor oil coming from primobol and anatate combined with four milliliters of castor oil and a little bit of benzoate from testosterone and anatate, both from Bayer or the testosterone and anatate was from Rotex, I can't really remember. It was castor oil, C-reactive protein between 0.5 to one milligram per liter. Yeah? I don't drink, I smoke cigars a few times per year, but not frequently. Um, I'm not allergic to gluten, thank God, <laughs> because I do enjoy my bread. I have an air purifier here that's blasting 24-7 and I don't drink the tap water. I have filtration water. And what was the last one? Um, yeah, I do train hard, but not to the point that my C-reactive protein goes sky high. Maybe I should train a little bit harder. Okay, so all of that out of the way, when you see your high sensitivity C-reactive protein higher than one milligram, two milligram, or five milligrams per liter, you need to discontinue whatever carrier oil you're using. Your body doesn't like it. It's telling you, bro, please stop. Don't inject this stuff into my body. It's not good. Because what happens when you have high C-reactive protein levels and tremendous systemic inflammation, you're damaging the inside of your arteries, promoting cardiovascular disease. So when you take steroids, HDL goes down in 90% of the cases. LDO goes up in 90% of the cases. And if you do a moderate amount of performance enhancers, you know, for hormone replacement, 
your lipid levels are probably not going to change that much. But when you're blasting your socks off, with synthetic carrier oils, a considerable amount of trembolone, winstrol, or any other compound that's going to skew your lipid levels, you're basically begging for it, begging for cardiovascular disease. So please give it to me. Yeah, synthetic carrier oils, high LDL, transforms into foam cells. It gets stuck inside the inside of the artery. Calcium goes in there. It gets blocked. It slowly, slowly, but surely shortens and narrows the inside of your artery. If that happens anywhere near your heart and you got a minor blood clot, you block it and it's game over. So even though it's a slow and steady progression of systemic inflammation, skewed lipid levels, eventually resulting in plaque buildup, now that you know, why take the risk? I knew this a long time ago. I made several videos about this. I plastered it all over Instagram, but I still get daily questions about, oh, bro, is this carry all okay? Oh, my C-reactive protein is 50 milligrams per liter. And honestly, it needs to stop. Honestly. Yeah. So, what is not suitable? These organic carrier oils are suitable. You can use them. I've tested many of them besides peach and tea oil, but I've seen it on clients' blood work that it doesn't increase C-reactive protein levels significantly. I just want to make it perfectly clear that you can't curcumin your way around systemic inflammation. Yeah? You can't take supplements. You need to take the source of the inflammation away. And it doesn't matter how much supplements you take, you can only marginally decrease your C-reactive protein level. Another cause before we go into the synthetic carrier oils, another thing you will notice is when you're chronically inflamed is that your elbows and knees or any other joint that you have uh, issue with or you put load under are going to be painful. And it took me two to three years to resolve those issues. So I had chronically painful knees. Couldn't even walk down the stairs. It was so painful. It was, I felt like it was going to break, tear in half. The inflammation around my knees got so bad that every time I did a leg workout, I'd have to use a huge amount of Tiger Balm and a high percentage capsaicin cream, rub that all over my knees and inner knees, and then use a knee sleeve, which is now completely disposed of, use a knee sleeve to keep that all in place and prevent that from going anywhere else, just so I can feel the pain of the inflammation. And just take the reps and the tempo of the exercise very, very slowly, warm everything up. My knees would literally be on fire, <laughs> on fire. <laughs> but I'd be able to train. And uh, for the guys that follow me a couple of years ago, you would always see me with those knee sleeves and, and uh, you know, blotched uh, from tiger from the red tiger bomb. Luckily, that's completely over and resolved now. My knees almost feel brand new, almost. But it still took five to six years of stopping synthetic carrier oils completely before I feel as good on my knees as I do now. Luckily, I don't have to use any Tiger Balm anymore just to be able to bend my knees. Take it from me, it will eventually get better, but it still might take a couple of years before you feel comfortable going ass the grass on the squat or doing a knees to chest leg press. It will get better, just give it some time. Now that you know, you should stop the synthetic carrier oil today. Not tomorrow, today. Yeah. So let's go over the synthetic carrier oils. And finish up the video. Migliol, 840, 817, 187. I'm not sure what the numbers is. Some people it causes systemic inflammation. Some people it doesn't. Again, it's only used, being used by underground labs. So I'm not sure if it's exactly Migliol or MCT or coconut oil. <sighs> Who knows, right? There's no third-party testing, no quality control besides a little Photoshop uh, HLPC test. <laughs> Perhaps if they go that far or reputation on the boards, which can be bought also. Again, so, Miglil, I'm not really sure. Might be, might not be. Guaiacol, 100% poison. Stay away from that. Once you open a vial, you will immediately know it's Guaiacol because it smells horrendous. It smells like something you would use to clean your car, yeah? or, or remove rust, or clean the toilet with. Ugh. No, throw it away. Propylene glycol. Toxic, stay away from it. And whether that's the PEG 300 or the PEG 400, throw it away. Same for MIG or MEG, uh, monoethylene glycol, whatever number comes behind it. Toxic, stay away from it. It will cause systemic inflammation. Ethyl oleate causes systemic inflammation. I have no idea why it's FDA approved. I know at least in America they didn't FDA approved it, probably because of the problems that many people experience with ethyl oleate. It's been understood on the steroid boards for, for many, many years. 
that people get an allergic response to ethyl oleate. They probably didn't go as in depth as I did just now in this video. It's not test flu. It's systemic inflammation. You're, you inject it into your body. You get those flu-like symptoms. It has nothing to do with high test. It has nothing to do with high levels of androgens. It's the carrier oil and your liver is starting to pump out C-reactive protein like there's no tomorrow and your body is going to a super high inflamed state. You think you feel sick, you're just super inflamed. And now you've got so much systemic inflammation going on that a person suffering from rheumatoid arthritis would happily, happily switch places with you. And let's leave it at that. Organic carrier oil is hands down the best. Castor oil, my favorite, and everything else. I wouldn't even touch it. Yeah, you should respect your body and whatever compounds you can use that doesn't damage your body in the process. Those are the ones you end up using for longer periods of time. And I wouldn't even consider injecting ethyl oleate, propylene glycol, monoethylene glycol, migliol, man, which, one, which one did he forgot? Arachis oil I don't want to inject. I can build all the muscle I need with Bayer Testoviron and Bayer Primabolin. And so can you. There's absolutely no reason to use synthetic carry oils and walk around with systemic inflammation for years on end. And that pretty much wraps it up. If you made it to the end of the video, please leave me a like on your way out. If you're not subscribed, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell button. Do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. I'm the only one talking about this stuff. So you got to stay tuned for the latest information so you can stay super, super healthy while you... Um, recreationally use performance enhancing drugs thank you guys so much for watching next video see you guys then